Chapter 5 Further Examination of the Epistles Passing over for the present the Apostle Paul's presentation of the sevenfold unity of Christianity in Ephesians 4, and his identification of the body and the bride in chapter 5, Paul does not mention the bride of Christ in Ephesians 5. The bride is Israel and is not the same as the body of Christ, which is us today, which we shall discuss later. We turn now to others of the prison epistles to see if we can find the slightest intimation of a new revelation given after Paul reached Rome. Unquestionably, Philippians was written during the Roman imprisonment, but we search its four precious chapters in vain for the least suggestion that he has received anything new to unfold. In chapter 1, where he presents Christ as the believer's life, he shows how thoroughly the evangelistic spirit had taken possession of him, it was not the evangelistic spirit that got hold of Paul. Rather, the Lord said of Paul, He is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles, and kings, and the children of Israel, Acts 9 verse 15. Paul said, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me, if I preach not the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 16. Therefore, Paul did not just get caught up in the evangelistic spirit. Rather, Paul was doing what the Lord Jesus Christ told him to do, which is why he was the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, Ephesians 3 verse 1. So that even in his prison cell he was rejoicing that Christ was being preached whether in pretense or in truth, and his own desire is that this same Christ may ever be magnified in his body, whether in life or in death. He urges the saints to stand fast in one spirit contending for the very faith which he had already made known to them. There is not a hint that he has now something new to reveal, that is, that the old dispensation to which they had hitherto belonged had come to a close, and that a new one had begun. The dispensational break is in Acts 9 not here in Philippians. In chapter 2 he dwells on Christ as our example, Paul does not say that Christ is our example, rather, he says that we should. Allow the mind of Christ to lead us. Philippians 2 verse 5, which he told the Corinthians that we have, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16. Rather, Paul tells the Philippians that they should follow Paul, and that they have Paul and Timothy as their ensamples, not Christ, Philippians 3 verse 17, simply because we are not minister, s, of the circumcision as Jesus was, Romans 15 verse 6, the, and shows how he himself and Timothy and Epaphroditus during the years had sought to follow in Christ's steps, and this is still before his soul. They are doing the work of Christ, Philippians 2 verse 30, rather than following in Christ's steps. Paul specifically tells them, brethren, be followers together of me, Philippians 3 verse 17. He never tells them to follow Christ. In the third chapter, he recounts his past experiences and self-confidence in the old days before he was saved, and then shows how the change was brought about by a sight of the risen Christ. The change was not brought about by a sight of the risen Christ. He told the Corinthians that we walk by faith, not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7, and that though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 16. Rather, the change was brought about by the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, Colossians 2 verse 11. In other words, upon salvation, Christ gave Paul, and all believers since, for that matter, the ability to set aside the lusts of the flesh and walk in the Spirit, Galatians 5 verse 16. This change was made possible, not by a sight of the risen Christ, but by Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, so that we may now live by the faith of the Son of God, Galatians 2 verse 20, rather than by sight. From that moment on, he counted all things as loss for the one who had won his heart. Won his heart sounds like an emotional response, which was not the case. Paul made a distinctive counting as a new creature in Christ, recognizing that the things he gained by the Jewish religion paled in comparison to the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Philippians 3 verse 8. Therefore, Paul used the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16, to make his decision to know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, Philippians 3 verse 10, rather than following his one heart.
He was pressing on toward the mark for the prize of the calling of God on high in Christ Jesus. He calls upon them whom he designates as perfect to be thus minded. Perfect here means mature, or we might even say well-rounded or well-balanced. Perfect means complete in Christ. All members of the body of Christ are complete in Christ. Colossians 2 verse 10. We have all been given the mind of Christ, even the immature and carnal among us, as Paul calls the Corinthians carnal in the very next verse after he says that they have the mind of Christ, I Corinthians 2 16 3 colon 1. Therefore, Paul's call is for all members of the body of Christ to be thus minded, Philippians 3 verse 15, not just the well-rounded ones. And, by the way, what does well-rounded or well-balanced mean? Nothing is needed to give them this perfection in addition to what they already had. Surely, if anywhere, this was the place to show them that hitherto they were but babes and had only received an initial revelation, but that now he had something for them of an altogether new character which would perfect them in Christ. Yes, they are already complete in Christ. However, this is based on the revelation of the mystery given to Paul in Romans, Galatians. It is not based on the books of Matthew and forward, as Ironside implies. But there is no word of any such added truth, nor yet in the last chapter where he exhorts to unity and peace among themselves. May we not say that Paul is singularly remiss in not sharing with his old converts at Philippi the new revelation he had received, if such a thing were really true? Ephesians, Colossians, gives further revelation of mystery doctrine that is not found in Romans, Galatians. This new doctrine is of our position in heavenly places. For example, Philippians 3 verses 20 to 21 says that our lifestyle should be representative of someone who is already in heaven, because, as far as God is concerned, we are already there. Romans, Galatians, did not go into this detail. Matthew, John's focus is on the earth, as we see Jesus telling his disciples to pray for God's kingdom to come to earth and for God's will to be done on earth, as it is in heaven, see Matthew 6 verse 10. Therefore, if Ironside tries to lump Paul's epistles in with what Jesus said in Matthew, John, he will not even see our position in heavenly places. Sadly, mainstream Christianity is in the same ignorance as Ironside is in. But it was not true, all the reasoning of the ultra-dispensationalists to the contrary notwithstanding, for when we turn over to Colossians, we find him once more reiterating the same truths he had proclaimed for a generation. Again, this is not true. Colossians 1 verse 5 says that our hope is laid up for us in heaven, not on earth. Colossians 1 verses 16 to 20 talks about how Jesus is the head of the body and will reconcile all things to himself through his cross work. It also gives the governmental structure of heaven. This information is not found before Ephesians. If Paul was just rehashing old doctrine, the books of Ephesians, Colossians would serve no purpose and, thus, would be omitted from the Bible. He shows that two ministries had been committed to him from the first. Wait a minute. The Acts 28 crowd says that Paul had two ministries, one from Acts 9 to 28 and one afterward. The Acts 9 position says he only had one. Is Ironside now agreeing with the Acts 28 crowd that Paul had two ministries? He had been made a minister of the gospel. What gospel? Not the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus committed to the twelve apostles, Matthew 24 verse 14, but the gospel of the grace of God, Acts 20 verse 24. The twelve apostles recognized that Peter was given a different gospel than Paul was, Galatians 2 verse 7. Why won't Ironside make the same recognition? That gospel has been preached in all the creation which is under heaven. According to Romans 1 verse 20, the gospel preached in all creation is that there is a Godhead, who we should worship, due to his eternal power seen in creation. Revelation 14 verses 6 to 7 calls this the everlasting gospel. The gospel for today is different which is to trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sins, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4. Therefore, by his statement, Ironside is not even recognizing the gospel of the kingdom or the gospel of the grace of God as today's gospel. He had also been made a minister of the mystery which hath been hidden from ages and generations, but now, he says, is made manifest to his saints to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in, or, among, by adding, 
or, among, Ironside shows he does not believe that we have the mind of Christ, even though 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16 says that we do. You, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man, and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present. Every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily, Colossians 1 verses 26 to 29. Let it be carefully observed that he is here covering the entire ministry. Ironside says that Paul has two ministries, one, preaching the everlasting gospel, and two, preaching the mystery. Thus, Ironside says that there is no salvation in the mystery, which is not true, because the mystery includes the gospel of the grace of God. But, now Ironside says that the mystery covers his entire ministry. So, which is it? Does Paul have two ministries, or one? He had no such opportunity to preach to multitudes while he was in his Roman, or as some think, his Caesarean prison at the time he wrote this epistle. But he tells us what had characterized his ministry throughout the years. Other saints there were whom he had not met personally, as well as those at Coloss. He thinks of the Laodicean believers, and he longs that they all may be brought into the knowledge of this mystery. But it is not something new. As mentioned before, Colossians is progressive revelation of the mystery, rather than being something completely new. However, it is still new information that is revealed in Romans, Colossians. The scripture Ironside quote says that these epistles are how God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Therefore, while the Colossians would already be familiar with mystery doctrine from reading Romans, Galatians, the epistle to them expounds upon the riches of the glory of this mystery. It is that which has ever characterized his teaching. The epistle of Titus is not of course a prison epistle at all, but it was written later than any of those that are so designated, excepting 2 Timothy. In this letter, Paul instructs the younger preacher, Titus, as to the divine order for local churches, the work of a true pastor, and the testimony committed to the servants of God. Surely here, if anywhere, we should expect him to put before Titus the fact that the transitional period has now come to an end. And Titus must ring the changes as the ultra-dispensationalists do today, on body truth, closed doors, Jewish gospels, kingdom age, etc., etc., ad nauseum. But, no, none of these terms so frequently used and played upon until one is wearied, are suggested to Titus. He is simply to go on preaching and teaching the very same things that have been taught during his earlier association with the Apostle Paul. Yes. The epistle to Titus is concerned with holding fast the faithful word, Titus 1 verse 9, of the mystery. However, just because there is no new dispensation beginning with Paul after Acts 28, it does not mean that there was no new dispensation beginning with Paul in Acts 9. The brief letter, to Philemon, we may pass over as we would hardly expect to find anything doctrinal in it, and yet even here if Paul's heart were throbbing with the joy of some absolutely new opening up of truth, we would almost wonder how he could help saying a word about it, at least to his friend Philemon. Hebrews was undoubtedly written very shortly before the apostles martyrdom, granting that it is from the pen of Paul. Hebrews was written to the Hebrews. Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13. As such, Paul could not have written it. Furthermore, Hebrews had to have been written before Acts 7, because Hebrews 3 verse 15 says, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, and Hebrews 3 verse 13 tells them to exhort one another daily, while it is called today. This today period ended with the stoning of Stephen. We also see conditional salvation in Hebrews, which is characteristic of Israel's program. For example, Hebrews 6 verses 4 to 6 says that it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance. Contrast this with Romans 5 verse 9 which says, Much more than, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. That this is so, I have tried to make clear in my book on the epistle to the Hebrews, and I shall not attempt to go into it now. But in any case, it was undoubtedly written. Very shortly before the destruction of Jerusalem, it was undoubtedly not written then, for Israel's program had not been set aside when the book of Hebrews was written, and here, if anywhere, 
One might expect these Hebrew believers to be told that the kingdom age is now over, the transition period has now been finished, and it is for them to accept the new revelation of body truth. But we search in vain for anything of the kind. It is simply a normal presentation of the precious things of Christ, showing how completely Old Testament types have had their fulfillment in Him and His finished work, and that all who believe now come under the blessings of the New Covenant. Hebrews is a Jewish book, showing the necessity of what Jesus did and how it will bring about a New Covenant for Israel. How could Ironside say that the New Covenant is in effect now and is for all who believe, when Jeremiah 31 verse 31 clearly says, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Furthermore, Hebrews 8 verse 13 says, Now that which decayeth and waxeth old I is ready to vanish away. Therefore, at the time of the writing of Hebrews, the new covenant had not been put in place yet. Probably later than Hebrews is the second letter to Timothy. It was penned during Paul's second imprisonment, very shortly before his death. As this occurred in AD 66 or 67, we may see how far along we have come and still no mention of any new revelation. So far as the truth that is dealt with is concerned, 2 Timothy might have been written any time before the first imprisonment. It is in perfect harmony with all the apostles' previous ministry. The purpose of 2 Timothy is not to impart new doctrine. Rather, it is to tell Timothy not to stray from the mystery doctrine he already knows. Hold fast the form of sound words, 2 Timothy 1 verse 13. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things, 2 Timothy 2 verse 7. Study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, 2 Timothy 2 verses 15 to 16. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, 2 Timothy 3 verse 14. Preach the word, 2 Timothy 4 verse 2. These exhortations are given in light of the fact that most people who believe the mystery doctrine have since gone away from it. Paul says, This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, 2 Timothy 1 verse 15. Therefore, 2 Timothy is written to exhort Timothy to continue in mystery doctrine, in spite of the fact that most people have turned away from it. The same is true today. We should not follow the Christian crowd into apostasy, but now there are other epistles to be considered. We have already seen that Paul makes no claim to being the sole depository of the revelation of the mystery. He says it was made known to Christ's holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, and so we turn to consider the writings of other apostles and prophets asking, have we in them any intimation of a new revelation after Paul went to Rome? After Jesus ascended to the Father, Ephesians 4 verse 8, is when he gave some apostles and some prophets, Ephesians 4 verse 11. Therefore, apart from the twelve apostles in Matthew, John, and the prophets in Israel, Jesus gave apostles and prophets to the body of Christ exclusively, and those apostles and prophets continued till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, Ephesians 4 verse 13. In other words, the apostles and prophets would last until all of God's word to the body of Christ was completed. Galatians 2 verse 7 says that the twelve apostles of Israel's program recognized that they were given a different gospel than what was given to Paul for the mystery program. Based on that, Galatians 2 verse 9 says that the twelve apostles would confine their ministry to the circumcision only, meaning the saved Jews in Israel's dispensation. Therefore, Hebrews' revelation are books written to Israel in their dispensation only. Thus, these books are not directly applicable to the body of Christ today. Therefore, there will not be found any mystery doctrine in these books, even though the apostles of Israel's dispensation were familiar with mystery doctrine after it was revealed to Paul. We may dismiss the epistle of James as not touching on this question. It is addressed definitely to the twelve tribes scattered abroad, and is God's last word, as it were, to those of Israel who were still more or less linked in spirit to the synagogue. Ironside is saying that James is written to Israel, but he refuses to identify the change in dispensations. Therefore, he comes up with this idea that James was written to those of Israel who were still more or less linked in spirit to the synagogue. Exactly who are these people if they are not saved Israel in Israel's dispensation? And, since Ironside recognizes that James is written to Israel, 
Why does he not recognize that Hebrews is written to the Hebrews, 1 Peter is written to scattered Israel, 1 Peter 1 verse 1, and all of the other epistles through Revelation were also written to Israel only. Bullingerites generally tell us that James was the first epistle to be written, but this is absurd on the face of it. It is quite evident that James is a corrective epistle. Yes, James is a corrective epistle based on a bad application of Hebrews doctrine. It has nothing to do with Paul's writings, because they are in a different dispensation. It must have been written after the doctrine of justification by faith, as proclaimed by Paul, had been widely preached, for James writes to check those who were abusing that doctrine and using it as an occasion for the flesh. No one can read chapter 2 thoughtfully without seeing that it is based upon, and has in view throughout, Paul's teaching in Romans 4. How is that? Paul says in Romans 3 verse 28 that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. James says in James 2 verse 24 that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Paul uses Abraham as an example of justification by faith alone, because he says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness, Romans 4 verse 3. James, on the other hand, uses Abraham as an example of justification by faith plus works, because he says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works, when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? James 2 verse 21 James 2 uses Abraham to show justification by faith plus works. Romans 4 uses Abraham to show justification by faith alone. James does not build upon Romans. Rather, it uses a different argument to come to a different conclusion for a different dispensation. James does not contradict Paul in the slightest degree. I just cited Romans 3 verse 28 that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, and James 2 verse 24 that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. How do these verses not contradict each other, since they state two different ways of being justified, but he does show that there is another justification than that of which Paul speaks. The Great Apostle 2 The Gentiles deals particularly with justification by faith before God. James, the apostle to the twelve tribes, emphasizes justification by works before men. First, James says justification is by faith plus works, not works alone, James 2 verse 24. Second, where does Ironside get the idea that James is talking about justification by works before men? The first example James uses is of Abraham offering his son on the altar. The only person around to see this work would have been Isaac, who certainly would not have justified his son for trying to kill him. Nor would any other man say, you know that Abraham, I thought he was an evil person, but, now that I see that he almost made a human sacrifice out of his son, he is a just man in my book. That very thought is absurd. The second example James uses is of Rahab being justified by keeping the spies from Israel safe, James 2 verse 25. Rather than justifying her, the men around her would have had her killed for helping the enemy. No resident of Jericho would have said that harlot, Rahab, was an evil person, but she is justified in my eyes now, because she lied to her fellow countrymen to allow the enemy to come and destroy us. Again, this is an absurd thought. Furthermore, even if James was talking about justification before men, who cares about that? Michael Jackson was justified by works before men in that over one million people wanted to attend his funeral. But that does not mean he has eternal life in Christ, because it is God that justifieth, Romans 8 verse 33, not man. First Peter was probably written before Paul's second imprisonment. Second Peter was certainly written afterwards, and all of Paul's letters were already in circulation when this epistle was penned. Note Peter's own words, and account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction, to pet. 315, 16. It is impossible to understand these verses excepting in the light of the fact that all the epistles of Paul were already in circulation. At least some of Paul's epistles had to be in circulation at this time, not necessarily all of them. Most scholars put the dates of the Hebrew epistles. Hebrews Revelation A lot later than they really were written, 
because they do not rightly divide the word of truth. Note that Peter says that Paul wrote according to the wisdom given unto him. Thus, Peter confirms that what Paul wrote was a dispensation of the gospel that was committed unto him, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 17, that came to him by the revelation of Jesus Christ, Galatians 1 verse 12. If Paul's revelation was not different from what Peter wrote, Peter would not say that Paul's epistles contained some things hard to be understood. Does Peter then tell us that a new dispensation had come in, and that the middle wall between Jew and Gentile having now, for the first time been broken down and the one body formed, the believers to whom he writes, Peter does not write to the body of Christ. He writes to the little flock, Luke 12 verse 32, of Israel. With the dispensational change at Acts 9, Peter recognized that he was to go only to the circumcision, while Paul went to the heathen, Galatians 2 verse 9. The circumcision, in this context, must refer only to saved Jews as part of Israel's program, because the heathen is defined in Acts 9 verse 15 as Gentiles, and kings, and the children of Israel, Acts 9 verse 15. Therefore, Peter only wrote to saved Jews, who are part of Israel's program. He did not write to the body of Christ. This is evident by Peter's statement that Paul wrote according to the wisdom given unto him, 2 Peter 3 verse 15. As such, Peter did not need to explain mystery doctrine to them. They could go to Paul's epistles for that, who were of Jewish extraction, are to recognize this new revelation. Not at all. Peter has never heard of any such thing. What? Peter had never heard that the middle wall between Jew and Gentile had been broken down? Ironside, himself, just a few pages prior, stated, with regard to Peter, this was to him an intimation that in Christ the distinction between Jew and Gentile was henceforth to be done away, and he makes it perfectly clear that this was his conviction when he stood up to preach in the household of Cornelius, Acts 10 verse 34, to end. Moreover, his epistles emphasize the same fact, though not in the full way that those of the Apostle Paul do. So, Ironside says that Peter recognizes in his epistles that the distinction between Jew and Gentile has gone away. Then, just a few pages later, Ironside states that Peter has never heard of any such thing. He puts Paul's writings on the same plane as the other scriptures. This shows that Paul's epistles are just as much a part of the Word of God as the red letters of Jesus in Matthew, John, but warns against the danger of misunderstanding, and so resting them. Peter said, They that are unlearned and unstable rest, Paul's scriptures, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction, 2 Peter 3 verse 16. That is exactly what Ironside, and all of mainstream Christianity, do with Paul. Instead of considering Paul's writings so that the Lord will give them understanding in all things, 2 Timothy 2 verse 7, they fail to recognize the new dispensation that the Lord Jesus Christ started with Paul. Therefore, they do not rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. Therefore, they are unlearned and unstable, resulting in resting Paul's scriptures, as well as the rest of the Bible, trying to make it all fit into their religion instead of resting in the simplicity that is in Christ, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3, by just believing what God says in his word. It really is that simple. Long years after all the other apostles had gone home to heaven, we find the aged John still preserved in life and caring for the churches of God. Revelation 1 verse 3 says that the time is at hand for the events in Revelation. That means that Revelation had to have been written before Acts 7, because, once Jesus stood up and judged Israel in Acts 7 verse 55, the time was no longer at hand. I know Christians say that Revelation was written at the end of John's life and was the last book of the Bible written, but that is based on faulty church history and a lack of rightly dividing the word of truth. I would much rather believe God's word over what man says. Since God's word says the time is at hand at the writing of the book, Revelation must have been written before Acts 7. According to apparently reliable church history, church history would have you believe that the books of the New Testament were not considered scripture until the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD declared them to be so. Yet, Peter calls Paul's epistle scripture in 2 Peter 3 verse 16 before the Bible was even completed. Church history, therefore, is highly unreliable. He made his home in Ephesus, and moved about an old age among the other churches mentioned in the first three chapters of the book of the Revelation, those churches which the Bulgarites declare never existed in. 
the past, but are still to arise as Jewish assemblies in the Great Tribulation. These churches existed in the past and will exist in the future tribulation period, as well. Most prophecy has a near fulfillment and a future, complete fulfillment. Such is the case with the seven churches. It is funny that Ironside tries to get his audience not to believe Acts 28 heirs, because they say the Jewish assemblies will exist in the future, when Ironside himself says that these churches never existed at all past, present, or future. Rather, Ironside says they represent seven church ages over the last 2,000 years. Therefore, it is Ironside who twists God's word here, not the Acts 28 heirs. Could anything be much more grotesque? Yes, Ironside's views, that side with man and discard what God's word says, are much more grotesque than what Acts 28 heirs say here. John's epistles were written according to the very best authority we have, sometime in the last decade of the first century of the Christian era. No, the very best authority we have is God's word, not biblical scholars. God's word says that Revelation was written around 30 AD, because it says that the time of the tribulation period was in its at-hand phase when the book was written. Liberal, biblical scholars set dates for New Testament books way too late in time so as to make their theories plausible. For example, with the four Gospels, these scholars like to say that they were written a generation or two after Jesus by people not named Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. That way, they can say that the Gospel writers copied each other, made errors, made Jesus into God when he was not, the miracles never happened, etc. As such, it is best not to trust what these scholars say. Weigh this well. Paul had been in heaven for nearly 30 years. Says who? John was an inspired apostle, God's word is inspired, 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, not the men who wrote it. John merely wrote what the Holy Ghost told him to write down, 2 Peter 1 verse 21, and surely would know, if anyone did, of the new revelation and its importance. But we search his letters in vain for the least reference to anything of the kind. That is because John wrote down the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to shew unto his servants things which must shortly come to. Pass, Revelation 1 verse 1. Therefore, John was given a different revelation for a different group of people than what Paul was given from the Lord Jesus Christ. Furthermore, the mystery had not even been revealed yet. In fact, we find the very opposite. False teaching had come in, and he writes to garrison the hearts of the saints against it. False teaching creeps in almost immediately wherever truth is found, regardless of dispensation. Paul told the Galatians that he marveled that they were so soon removed unto another gospel, which is not another. Galatians 1 verses 6 to 7. Dot. In order to do this, he refers them back to that which was from the beginning, namely, to the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ himself and his apostles, as a careful reading of his first epistle makes abundantly clear. There is not the slightest basis for the thought that a fuller unfolding of truth had been vouchsafed to Paul and others about 30 years after Christ's ascension. First, the mystery was revealed to Paul about one year after Christ's ascension. Second, revelation was before that time. Therefore, John could not have spoken of the mystery at that time. Third, the fact that the teaching of Jesus in his earthly ministry is pertinent shows that the revelation is written to Israel in their program. It has nothing to do with the mystery dispensation, committed unto Paul. It is the message that they had heard from the beginning which he again commends to them, because they are still in the kingdom dispensation. Let us imagine the late Dr. Bullinger, or some of his lesser satellites, living, not in the 20th century, but in the closing days of the first century of the Christian era. Filled with their ideas of a new revelation given to Paul in prison, can you by any stretch of the imagination think of them writing epistles or treatises in which no reference whatever is made to the supposedly new doctrines? First, Paul's writings fulfill the word of God, Colossians 1 verse 25. As such and contrary to popular belief, nearly all of the New Testament writings, outside of Paul, were written before the mystery was given to Paul. Therefore, Ironside's analogy is incorrect from the start. Second, the new doctrines of the mystery dispensation were not for the people in Israel's program to follow, even after. The twelve apostles of Israel's program understood the mystery. They agreed that Paul would go to all unbelievers with mystery doctrine, 
while the twelve would continue with doctrine for Israel's program among the believing remnant of Israel only, Galatians 2 verse 9. Therefore, even in their later writings, the twelve apostles would not mention the mystery. Third, if a new revelation had not been given to Paul, then God is lying, because God's word specifically says that Paul taught what he learned by the revelation of Jesus Christ, Galatians 1 verse 12. Ironside and fundamental Christianity make two errors here. One, they think that the apostles and prophets that Paul refers to would be those from Jesus' days on earth. However, that cannot be the case. Otherwise, Paul would have been taught the new doctrine by Ananias, rather than by Jesus Christ. Since Paul says that, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 17, and that in me first Jesus Christ might shew forth all longsuffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting, 1 Timothy 1 verse 16, we must conclude that the apostles and prophets of Ephesians 2 verse 20 must be the ones that came after Paul, which makes sense in light of the fact that Jesus Christ gave apostles and prophets to the body of Christ after his ascension. Ephesians 4 verses 8 to 13. 2. They assumed that the New Testament was all written after Paul received the mystery in Acts 9. Therefore, they conclude that Paul is just another apostle. However, the scripture I have shown proves that man's philosophy is wrong in this case. Scripture supports the idea that most of the New Testament, outside of Paul's epistles, was written before Acts 7, and the apostles and prophets in Paul's epistles being ones given specifically to the body of Christ after the mystery was revealed to Paul in Acts 9. The fact of the matter is that these men today can scarcely open their mouths without speaking of these things. Since eternal life and sanctification today only come about by believing the gospel found only in Paul's epistles, it is of the utmost importance that we focus on Paul's epistles. Similarly, we can say that mainstream Christianity can scarcely open their mouths without speaking of Jesus' words in Matthew, John. They put Jesus' words in red, and almost every sermon is centered around a New Testament passage outside of Paul's epistles. Why do they ignore Paul? Why do they ignore the Old Testament? Because they want to twist the Scripture to say that our works are involved in our salvation and in our sanctification, so that they can glory in the flesh, rather than in the cross of Christ. As many as desire to make a fair shoe in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ, they desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. Galatians 6 verses 12 to 13 No matter what text they begin to expound, they almost invariably wind up with something about their system of rightly dividing the word of truth. First, it is not their system, it is God's system. He is the one who said to rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, and he is the one who said that we learn how to do this by considering what Paul said, 2 Timothy 2 verse 7, as our apostle today, Romans 11 verse 13. Second, God specifically tells us in 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 that if we are to be approved unto God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, we must study God's word by rightly dividing the word of truth. Therefore, rightly dividing the word of truth is how we obey the commandment of the Lord, showing to others that we have been approved unto God and not being ashamed of our beliefs in the midst of the profane and vain babblings of man, 2 Timothy 2 verse 16. In short, we make a big deal out of right division, because God makes a big deal out of right division, and the importance of making the fine distinctions which they imagine they see in the word. As shown in my comments, these are far from being fine distinctions which are imagined. Rather, these are clear differences that even the twelve apostles in Acts 15 were forced to see before Paul had even written down any of the mystery as scripture. How much clearer, then, are these distinctions now that the full mystery has been revealed in God's written, inspired word, and we have the Holy Spirit to teach us the things of God, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9 to 16? Yet inspired men like Peter and John, again, Peter and John were not inspired. God's word is inspired, 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, not the writers. Peter and John merely wrote down what God told them to write down, 2 Peter 1 verse 21. They were not inspired to write their own words. The Lord Jesus Christ I as the word of God, John 1 verse 1. And without particularly going into it, 
we may add Jude, can expound and apply the truth of God in the fullest possible way. This is blasphemy to say that God's holy word is not his word, but is the words of the writers as they expound and apply the truth of God. Epistles in Scripture are not man's commentary on God's word. Rather, they are God's word on an equal level with the rest of Scripture, including Jesus' precious words in red, without any reference to anything of the kind. The Old Testament writers applied the truth of God without ever mentioning that Jesus would die on a cross and it is also probably impossible to figure out, from Old Testament writings alone, that he would rise from the dead. That is because, according to Hebrews 9 verse 8, the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. This is true for the first 4,000 years of man's history, even though Jesus' death and resurrection are absolutely essential for the salvation of those who lived during those 4,000 years. Fundamental Christianity refuses to accept this as fact, because it ruins their theory that there is only one gospel throughout all dispensations. However, not believing this is calling God a liar in Hebrews 9 verse 8, and God cannot lie, according to Titus 1 verse 2. Furthermore, trusting in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sins is only revealed in Paul's epistles. Granted, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection are in the Hebrew epistles, but trusting in that for salvation is not found there. How could this be missing from the Hebrew epistles? because it is only for the mystery program and not for Israel's program. Therefore, it should be expected that the mystery would not be revealed in scripture outside of Paul's epistles. What is the only legitimate conclusion? It is that this whole ultra-dispensational system is an idle dream unsupported by the testimony of the inspired writings. This is an illegitimate conclusion, because it fails to recognize the truth of the mystery as revealed in Paul's epistles alone and the lack of the same information being in any other part of the Bible. The rest of the Bible is just as true as Paul's epistles are, but the rest of the Bible has truth pertaining to God's kingdom on earth, while Paul's epistles have truth pertaining to God's kingdom in heaven. Error is never consistent. No, error is always consistent, i.e., it is consistently wrong, as Ironside's paper proves. A more accurate statement is that error is always wrong, and God's word is always right. I have shown many scriptures that prove that Ironside's paper is an error. It always overemphasizes some point, generally unimportant, and fails to recognize other things of great importance. Yes, that is exactly what fundamental Christianity does. It overemphasizes the red letters of the Bible, which are not to be followed today while failing to recognize the change in programs by the Lord Jesus Christ in Acts 9, which is of great importance, because you cannot even have eternal life today without the gospel found only in Paul's epistles. Heresy is simply a school of opinion in which something is particularly pressed out of proportion to its logical place. Yes, that is why Christianity says that they cannot understand the Bible, because they are propagating a school of opinion that is not supported by scripture as a whole. They must be taught by seminaries and by pastors how to change God's word to fit their heretical views, instead of resting in the simplicity that is in Christ, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3, by just believing what the Bible says. Who would dare to say that this system we have been attempting to refute is not therefore heretical? It is only heretical to those who have been blinded to the truth by the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. The only way fundamental Christianity succeeds in convincing people that they are standing on the truth of God's word, while right dividers are following a heretical system, is by dishonesty, walking in craftiness, and handling the word of God deceitfully, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 2. Mark, I do not mean to class it with what Peter calls damnable heresies, but it is certainly schismatic, and its votaries constitute a special school of opinion within the professed church of God a school that attaches great importance to something which after all is not evident to the vast majority of devoted and godly believers. Regarding the mystery, even before Paul died, he said, All they which are in Asia, be turned away from me. 2 Timothy 1 verse 15. He also said, At my first answer no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. 2 Timothy 4 verse 16. Now, we know that Paul was giving us mystery truth for today, or else his writings would not be in scripture since he says, that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord, 
1 Corinthians 14 verse 37. Since the vast majority of believers forsook truths for today for Jesus read letters while Paul was still alive, we should expect even more Christians to do the same nearly 2,000 years later. That the effect of this can only be division and harmful is not only self-evident, but has been abundantly manifest in many places. The effect of not accepting God's word rightly divided is harmful because it keeps you from doing God's will, which is for you to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. The Holy Spirit says, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself, Titus 3 verses 10 and 11. Therefore, the acts to position should be rejected, recognizing that those believing it are condemned of themselves. This is as certainly the word of God as anything else revealed in the scripture of truth. So, Ironside only puts Paul's epistles on the same level as other scripture when it benefits him. But, when Paul says he received the revelation of the mystery directly from Jesus Christ, Galatians 1 verses 11 to 12, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto Paul. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 17, Paul has his own gospel, Romans 2 verse 16, Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13, Paul was the first one saved under the mystery gospel, 1 Timothy 1 verses 15 to 16, etc. Suddenly, Paul's epistles are not authoritative scripture and must be changed to fit Ironside's heretical views.